Welcome to Portland, Oregon, the strip club capital of the world. I am one of the legions of Portland strippers, but I won't be taking my clothes off for you today. Alas, instead, I'll be asking you to strip. Away your prejudices and preconceived notions about my chosen work and that of my sister and brother and other sex workers. <laughs> Ultimately, my goal is for you to consider sex work as a feminist enterprise and stripping as art. <laughs> I first started stripping 26 years ago because I suspected these things were true that sex work could be feminist, and that stripping could be art. I had to investigate further. Now I've got an extra stake in the game. I'm the mother of an almost seven-year-old daughter. Hi, Charlotte. It feels more urgent to me than ever that the judgment in our culture around sex and bodies be healed. And I work tirelessly towards that. To date, I've published two, top, two books on the topic and over 100 essays, including one in the New York Times. <laughs> there is an opera based on my first book and a feature-length documentary based on my life. It is clear to me that people are willing to think about stripping and sex work from a more nuanced perspective. However, thinking about stripping and actually stripping are two different things. Many people still think it's weird that I strip. Sometimes I think it's weird. I'm the daughter of a Lutheran minister. I was a valedictorian of my high school class and a National Merit Scholar finalist. I'm an introvert with an intense history of body dysmorphia. This is not what anyone expected I would be doing with my life. I've always preferred the life of the mind. But it was the life of the mind that led me here. I did not think about stripping or sex work at all until I was required to do so in a senior seminar in sociology at Williams College in Massachusetts. In that seminar, entitled Bodies, Self, and Culture, we read an essay about a brothel in Dar es Salaam and how working in that brothel represented one of the only avenues of escape for women from Tanzania's stringent patriarchal structures, wherein a woman might be one of many wives with little access to education or independence. What this essay and our professor were asking us students to consider was whether sex work could be feminist, a path toward liberation, equality, and societal change. Well, this blew my 21-year-old mind. <laughs> While my peers were not as eager to embrace this idea that sex work might be feminist, to me, it was a no-brainer. Money is power in our society, after all. It seemed suspicious to me that this age-old industry, whose workers were primarily female, should be shamed and criminalized. What was the problem with sex work? Was sex the problem? Was sex really evil and shameful? Or was the problem that women would have power over their own bodies and financial power to boot? In the spring of my final semester at Williams College, I went to my first strip club. I walked in with all the prejudices and presuppositions I thought I was already too enlightened to have. That the place was seedy, the performers desperate. I walked out perturbed. What went on in that club was nothing short of alchemy. A woman took the stage and then slowly took off her clothes. 
At first, that seemed crazy. Then suddenly, so normal. Finally, it was straight up magical. The performers transmuted shame into power and vulnerability into strength, transcending and obliterating stereotypes. It was clear to me that the strip stage was a nexus of female power, and there was no denying that what went on up there was art. I was perturbed because I thought perhaps I'd found my calling. <laughs> Callings are odd. You don't get to choose them, and they can put you in very uncomfortable positions. I know my father felt called to the ministry, and that that wasn't necessarily convenient for him or for his young family. I've always felt I'm a chip off the old block. <laughs> called to preach about feminism and art on stage in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> I chose Portland because I wanted to pursue a career in the arts. I'm a writer and a musician, and at the time, Portland was cheap. <laughs> it was also as far as I could get from Massachusetts. I had no idea it was the strip club capital of the country. There are, in fact, more strip clubs here per capita than anywhere else. Now, you may have heard that and wondered why that is. The main reason is Oregon's constitution, ratified in 1857, accords more protection for speech than anywhere else in the nation. Every time a strip club's right to exist is impugned or a zoning question arises, Oregon courts determine over and over again that stripping and nudity are protected speech. The first club I stripped at was a tiny little neighborhood bar in Chinatown called Magic Gardens. <laughs> Never was a strip club more aptly named. Magic happened there, and little seeds of beauty and truth took root and flourished in performers and patrons alike. I took the stage that first shift with so much cultural baggage, body shame, loathing even of my lady parts, and a belief that once I had done this, stripped nude for cash, that I could never be forgiven, a fall from grace. But I was wrong. Instead, I found grace. This was my calling to speak truth to power from these stages and to take people on the same journey that I'd been on. From thinking that stripping was crazy, to realizing that it was normal, to understanding that it was magical. Here is how I do it. In Oregon, down at the clubs, we generally have three songs to work the magic. The first song, for me, is about connection. I saunter on stage in my bra and panties wrapped in my robe. I smile and say, hi, how are you? And I really want to know. I make eye contact. I ask where you're from and how much you like or dislike the music of Neil Young. <laughs> I often say that strip clubs are healing crucibles, and it is this connection that I am referencing. We have so little opportunity to genuinely connect in modern life. And connection can heal us all. The second song is about breasts. I take up my bra or my shirt, or my bikini top, much like you are going to do at some point today. I have to insist that this is normal. Just because breasts are sexualized in our culture and sex is considered dangerous and unpredictable and possibly bad does not mean that breasts are bad. <laughs> breasts are nourishing and nurturing. I believe that something calming happens deep within our nervous systems when we see breasts. 
we get a little bit of that nurturing mama energy back, and we so desperately need it. My breasts are weird. They're wall-eyed and scarred. I had breast cancer at age 34, a double mastectomy, and reconstruction. I'd never imagined I would strip again after that and was terrified the first time I took the stage to reveal my post-surgery breasts and post-chemo hair at the club. But no one blinks an eye. And my dearly beloved healing crucible, the strip stage, healed me yet again. The third song in Oregon is All Nude. Many thanks to our Constitution and the lawyers and judges who continue to uphold it. All Nude means shame goes out the window. All Nude means you get to meditate on a nude body the way you would in an art museum or a drawing class. All Nude is exercising our First Amendment rights. All nude is art. Naked bodies have always been art. Think about every art museum you've ever been to, or the 26,000-year-old naked lady statue known as the Venus of Willendorf. There are beautiful nudes of all size and shape from every culture. What these nudes don't generally feature, however, is a G-string because aesthetically, it's just not the best choice. <laughs> I stripped for a spell in New York City where I was required by law to wear a G-string, something that is common in places that don't enjoy Oregon's constitutional protections of speech. To me, that little triangle of fabric implied shame. A part of my body was too dangerous or too precious or too shameful to be seen. We are very lucky in Oregon that nudity is protected speech. It honors and celebrates our humanity. Now, there is a financial exchange that happens at strip clubs and, of course, with sex work more generally. I often think this is the most troubling part for people. But let me remind you, this is where life comes from. This. <laughs> This is the most valuable real estate on Earth. <laughs> you, I know! If we are going to say that women can't choose to use this all-powerful, priceless part of themselves to make money for themselves, that's misogyny. Now, you may be having some qualms about what I'm saying here today. That is normal. Many people do. My family, some of my friends, some of my coworkers. These are ideas I started thinking about 26 years ago in college that I have been researching ever since. Of course, I hope that my words inspire you to think about sex work more, if not differently. You may also be wondering about my sense of dignity. Being a woman in her late 40s with the audacity to continue to strip nude for cash. With, <laughs> with mastectomy scars, a C-section scar, and crow's feet. <laughs> Well, to me, it is intellectually irresistible. And I honestly believe that as a body changes and ages, the more it has to offer. I'm proud of my scars and the stories they tell. The stage elevates and consecrates all bodies and all stories. My idea is that sex work is valuable and important work. 
<laughs> my idea is that bodies should be revered and enjoyed. My idea is that stripping is art. I think we can all agree that our culture around sex and bodies is pretty screwed up. I hope you'll join me in reconsidering sex work as valuable and important work. Work that warrants the support of the state and the respect of the citizenry. We have everything to gain from this. Better lives for sex workers and better lives for ourselves. Thank you for supporting the arts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.